I'm Michael Dervin. I'm here in the splendour of Westport House to talk from afar with musicians from this year's Westport Festival of Chamber Music. The festival has had to relocate online because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, I'm only virtually here in Westport. In reality, I'm at home in Dublin, sitting in front of my computer to talk to oboist and conductor Nicholas Daniel. He is 534 kilometres away from me in St Neots, Cambridgeshire. That's 763 kilometres distant from Westport. Hi, Nick. Oh, hello, hello. Lovely to see you. Hi, good to see you again too. How has life been for you during COVID-19? Oh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very lucky. I'm a very lucky person because I have a, a wonderful teaching job in Germany. So at least financially, I'm secure. I've been doing it, well, for the whole of the time until July, the end of the semester, I was doing it online, apart from two short visits, um, and I'm doing a hybrid version. But that is a rare situation for a British musician um, to have one of those great jobs. And I, mm. trust me, I know how lucky I am. Um, it's been such a roller coaster as it has been for everybody. Um, and I think that the the, the extraordinary depression of the first few months has sort of changed um and i mean i was just i was i was i was desperate desperately sad seeing everything um in you know seeing my colleagues in so much trouble seeing my friends and and um and all my musical friends particularly just and actor friends just in desperate trouble so that hasn't stopped because there's still so few concerts happening. Um, there were a few uh, film and, and media recording sessions for the strings and very, very few for the winds. Um, but that, so that was good, but that's all kind of died off now for people I gather as well. But, you know, what I decided to do at a certain point, and I have to say that your compadre, Mr. John Gilhooley of the Wigmore Hall was was instrumental in, in, in shaking me out of my funk because he said that they had to have live concerts in June and asked me to do one of them. And that was a, an extraordinary situation, particularly as it happened two days after George Floyd's death. And so that shook us all, I mean, into, out of our state of complacency and into a new world and and I think that that's what the that's what since that point that's what I've been looking at. I've been looking at how when we rebuild this and this you know we are starting to rebuild things even though the results of that rebuilding may take time. When we rebuild it, are we going to rebuild it in its image as it was before, like uh, the old city of Warsaw, or are, with the old bricks, or are we going to actually really um, look anew? At and, and try to assess some of the things that we felt maybe we couldn't do anything about before, that now we possibly can. I don't know if you read today, but the Melbourne Symphony has come forward with an absolutely extraordinary set of proposals and action, um, including um, people from various ethnic minorities, including um, uh, uh, original Australians, First Nation Australians, a lot of local talent, a lot of traveling to schools and into people's communities. And, and of course with Australia, not using international talent means that there's a saving of air miles. And so there's a environmental aspect to it. So I'm trying to look at, at a big picture myself with particularly with a group of friends, um, well, a group of, some of them are very new friends, um, which is called Max Musician and Artists Exchange. And that group meets every week, we'll be meeting tomorrow. And we've been inviting various different sort of uh, well-known members of the, of the profession, particularly administrators, to talk to us and see what, how it's been for them, how things are, how we can help. Um, and I think there's a lot of different groups out there trying to do the same thing. My slight worry is that they're not quite collaborating enough because it's difficult when you can't get into a room and meet people easily. Mm. So I, I would say that it's, it's a long answer. <laughs> um, but the, uh, another thing that I've been trying to do is to really support 
my young black colleagues um, in the oboe world. And um, there's a wonderful scheme which Barbara Hannigan has started called Momentum Now, which is nothing to do with the British Labour Party. Um, <laughs> those that know that, that story, that's what's one of their titles. But um, so Barbara won a big prize, I think it was Canadian Music Prize, and just put all the money into a scheme whereby um, established artists can bring onto the stage with them uh, for a short part of their concert, a young artist that they believe in and have been mentoring. And since the summer, I've been mentoring a very, very um, interesting and talented group of, of young oboists, all of whom are black. And uh, that's a specific choice I wanted to help. I wanted to do something to help. So I reached out. And um, they, I've already had an amazing experience with Bryn Turville, um, the really one of the great singers of the world, because we did the Barbican's first concert was with him, and I did Ich habe genug Cantata 82 mm. Bach. And I also brought onto the stage with me a young Welsh oboist, Mavan Wee Price, who is black and a member of Chineke Orchestra. And she played some numbers with Bryn, lighter things, some, some, um, uh, some Welsh folk songs and some other songs. And actually it was, it was a total joy to do that. And I, I was so proud of it. And when I go on stage in November at the Maltings, Britain's Concert Hall, the mm -hmm. Maltings in, in near Aldborough, Snape, I'll be going on with a young oboist called Lorraine Hart, who is also, I believe, a great talent. Um, and we're going to play the arrival of Queen of Sheba together in a very mixed mm -hmm. program, actually, that includes Bach over and violin concerto, but also, astonishingly, a world premiere by John Taverner. Oh, wow. Which, which is very exciting um, because it's for, it was written in the last few months of his life, it's for oboe, counter tenor, string orchestra. I mean, I've said it that way around, it's really for counter tenor, oboe, string <laughs> orchestra. Um, <laughs> and that's with Andrew Watts, who's probably Britain's greatest operatic counter tenor talent. I mean, it's just like a voice, a voice that can fill any opera house, amazing. So um, Lorraine will be there sort of, helping also with like hearing balance and learning the music with me and then i'll bring her on stage and so her fee is shared between me i give her some of my fee momentum give her some fee and the britain symphonia who the concert's mm. with will also give her some fee so it's young artists um earning a little bit too because i i'm incredibly concerned about how young musicians see the profession now mm. and that there should be um I mean, funnily enough, I think in some ways they're slightly more fit for it than we are, actually. Oh. I don't mean fit musically. I mean that I think a lot of those young musicians that I've been working with and that I've met and that I, I know my own, my own daughter is a musical, musical theatre artist. And um, she's incredibly politically aware, incredibly aware of the reality of the arts and society. And... And I think young musicians are also more aware than some of their older counterparts. Perhaps as an oboist, I'm lucky because I have a, a, a non-jaded and also a slightly more realistic view. Um, some people have said to me, well, if you were a violinist or a pianist, you know, you'd just be playing the same five concertos around the world, mm. you know, earning 10 times more or whatever it is, 20 times, 30 times, 100 times more. Um, but that's not what being an oboist means. It means uh, many, many other things. So for me, it means doing a lot of commissioning. So I'm also incredibly concerned about our composers because I think that we have so many great composers um, in this neck of the woods. And I'm really concerned that, well, they've got to adapt too, haven't they? They've got to learn mm. how to write chamber music if they've not done it before, <laughs> because that's the reality. So many of the greatest composers do write chair music, but many of them have been locked in operas or symphony orchestra pieces or large ensembles. I mean, writing an opera takes a composer over for four years sometimes. Mm. Things have got to change. Mm. <laughs> you actually sound like you've been amazingly active. Uh, did you manage to, to, to get that way quite quickly? Because I find myself experiencing a kind of listlessness all the things I imagined I would do if I had lots of time that they just weren't being done and I had to come to terms with the fact that this undefined amount of extra time was kind of unmanageable 
you know there was there was, yes, there was no course, un destination unfortunately for you guys for you guys in in the republic it's back you know you're on you're on full lock i mean i'm so 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 sorry for it but yes i mean the thing is it's interesting because some people um a pianist who I, I work a lot with charles owen who, who you may have, have, mm -hmm. have heard Adam, yes. who i think is an amazing artist um he has just dug deep into his practice and he did that almost immediately i simply couldn't blow a note without crying to start with so i didn't mm -hmm. i took the chance at this stage in, in my life to to have a brain break i, I did a, a lot of meditation i walked every day I listened to, to, not to music, to podcasts. I listened to the spoken word. And my husband incredibly thoughtfully bought me a beautiful um, electric piano, which is made by Beckstein and Casio. Right. And it's got different concert hall sounds. And so I, I found music I wanted to play on it. And that was basically Bach and Mozart. And um, a little bit of Ravel, if I could get my hands around it, and Poulenc. I eventually got into Brahms songs, but that wasn't, I couldn't stand anything later than Mozart. I just couldn't do it. Very extraordinary situation. Um, I have other friends who simply have been in a totally lethargic state for months, um, genuinely angry, genuinely depressed. They, they've seemed to eventually find different ways of expressing themselves. Mm. I mean, for instance, Jennifer Johnston, the amazing mezzo-soprano, one of the great mezzo-sopranos of our, of, of, of this generation, um, first of all, organized the most astonishing cookbook, Notes from a Musician's Kitchen. And then she went on, and this is a woman with a degree from Cambridge University, not in music, uh, went on to, I think it's in law, her degree, went on to organize the Bite Size Proms, which you can find online if your listeners are interested. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did two of them, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was wonderful to do. I was very, very lucky that I've just finished the third of the th three recordings that I had in my diary, which were all rescheduled. Um, one of which was um, with my wind group Orsino Ensemble, which is a fairly mm -hmm. new wind group, which is kind of sort of managed by Adam Walker, the flute player. And it's an inc incredible group of musicians. And we were very lucky to do a, a wind and piano CD with Pavel Kolashnikov, who I think is one of the great young pianists around. Uh, and then I was very lucky to be able to record Mozart 13 Wind Serenade with Mark Simpson, the clarinetist, who put together the whole project. We recorded it at the beautiful Saffron Hall, which is a new concert hall in Cambridgeshire. And we also recorded his um, Geysir, which is for the same scoring 13 Wind, which we commissioned in Britain Symphonia. And then literally yesterday, I finished a recording with the Doric Quartet also for Shandos, of um, Bax, Bliss, Finzi, Vaughan Williams and Delius oboe quintet. So full, full, string quartet, full string quartet. And the Delius I actually recorded on the 1911 instrument that Leon Goossens played for his whole oh, wow. career. Leon Goossens, if your listeners and watchers don't know, was the, the preeminent British oboist in the mm. first, probably first and second half of the 20th century. And his instrument he played all his life, that instrument played in three of the four coronations of the 20th century. It premiered the, the Vaughan Williams Oboe Concerto. It gave the first British performance of the Strauss Concerto. And I have it sitting here in my room. I mean, his daughter has lent it to me. So I recorded... How, how, how does it feel to play? Uh, you know, oh. a, a, apart from the history, just it's, it's an well, old instrument. It's got to be yeah. different. It, it is completely different. It's got almost no keys. I mean, compared to mine, mine has got much more silver keys on it. Um, it. It feels like you're much more communing with nature with it. I feel closer to to the outdoors. I don't know quite why I feel that. It doesn't sound, it's a very cultured instrument. It's, it's not a small sounding instrument at all. In fact, I have to kind of rein it in a little bit, not to let it be too too bright, but it wants to be clean and clear. Um, I, I really wanted to record the Delius pieces on it because the two interludes from Fenimore and Gerda um, in Eric Fenby's arrangement with Oboe and String Quartet that he did for Goosens, that music for me is, is the, I think it's the first time I ever heard Goosens' sound as a youngster. Mm. I mean, that was, that was a long time ago now. And there's just that, but the thing that's the funny thing about playing it is I have to fight it 
not to do Goosens's rubato because Goosens's rubato was was Goosens's rubato, and I wouldn't necessarily pursue that same amount of vibrato mm. with a twenty first century sensibility. Mm. But I so I had to kind of get mm -mm, no 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 <laughs> not too much. <laughs> but the oboe wants to do it, and the same is true of vibrato, mm. which is the the sort of waveform mm. sound. It wants to do Goosens' is vibrato. So you know what? I said, okay, you can do that. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. I so have the impression kind of... of him as the man who brought vibrato to overplaying in Britain. Is that correct? That is true. That is absolutely true. It is historically true. Um, and uh, I, I think it's partly because of the musical family he was a member of. And he was, he was sort of slightly cajoled into playing the oboe, I mm -hmm. think, because I think they felt they wanted better oboist. So he, he was brought up in Liverpool. Um, and I think the Liverpool oboist was, was a terrific player and, and, uh, and teacher. And I think uh, Goosens was nudged every time he was playing a solo when he was about nine years old. <laughs> but I think, yeah, he, I mean, he was, we forget really the history because he, in the Second World War, I think it was, well, it was many months. He was at the top of the hit parade, which is the, the equivalent of the pop charts with his recording of the London Derriere. Oh. And um, uh, so that was, so he was very, very, very famous. And, and he, he just had a unique position in musical life. Then of course in 62, I think it was, which is the year I was born, he had that dreadful car accident and, and totally smashed up his face and then managed to rebuild. It took about two years, totally change of embouchure. Mm. I mean, the, the guts of the man, seriously. But you know, the thing is that What's so extraordinary is that the instrument, when I play it, it feels like he's here. And when I first played my first couple of notes on it, which was in Jenny, his daughter's living room down in, in Kent, she just burst into tears. I mean, and said, oh my God, it's like he's in the room. And she was so touched by it. And, and, and I feel that, I mean, I did some lovely projects on it. I did a Sibelius II on it. With the orchestra of the age of enlightenment and of course i did that because i mean i don't do much of that sort of orchestral playing but i wanted to do it because i know that sibelius heard goosens play that over because he phoned up this famous phone call from thomas beecham he said uh thank you Tommy. that was a great performance of the second symphony from the proms he'd heard it on the radio and he said uh, who's your oboist he said that's mr goosens and he said you could tell him he plays too beautifully <laughs> 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 I mean, it's, and, you know, it, it's fascinating. Did you have any difficulty uh, in the last six, nine months in staying musically and technically fit on the oboe? That's a good question. I, no, I didn't actually. I mean, it, it was, um, I don't know why I didn't. I think it's partly because mentally after decades of so much travel and so much stress i mean you don't realize the stress you're under mm. the, the traveling and the concertizing and the new halls different hotels not sleeping jet lag you don't realize i mean you live with it and because it's really important not to moan about it because it's great to do it but at the same time i don't think i realized what it was you know how how, how tough it was and so actually having time every day to just be myself, read, watch some TV, l do more cooking, you know. Actually, if you're mentally relaxed, funnily enough, it seems to come back quite quickly. I mean, I, I, there was a pit, there was a probably a couple of weeks after the, the long period of not playing when I needed to get back into shape, but I, I know how to do that because it's mm. like, and you know, there's just long notes and, and trills and stamina and, um, building it up, building up the breath, and it's. I, I think a lot of singers have found the muscles change, but that that I mean, it wasn't so long that I didn't mm. regularly practice for. So no, it could have been that. I mean, also in that time, you see, I've been from April. I have been teaching my students regularly. So I mean, um, to start with, like I said, it was very hard to pick up my elbow and play without just. I don't know, there was just so much grief. But then mm. then what happened was that I, I sort of felt the the air being so clean and the 
sky was so blue and the birds were so loud and and something else just took over so my brain and my body just started to relax and uh, yes I suppose it's what you might call a sort of sabbatical it's why people at different times do take sabbaticals why someone like Heifetz used to take the whole summer off he used to take mm. two months off in the summer I think it was Heifetz um and then he used to spend a couple of weeks getting back in shape and then he'd go straight off again mm. but um I have to say that I don't think I'm ever going to want to go back to working at the pace that I did before, because I, I, I don't know how good it is for you. <laughs> <laughs> and also I, I want to be able to share what's left of the profession with my younger colleagues. And so I, it's, I, I get a little bit frustrated when I see the same people, including myself perhaps, but I'm, I'm not doing that much. I mean, I've, this is, done one uh, one concert to an audience in eight months mm. um and i've got the second one in november so i'm not like holding it all <laughs> but uh, you know you do kind of see the same people popping up the they're incredible artists you can't say they're not the mitsuko shida you know the these people and probably they're the and i asked actually roger wright about this i said why why aren't you using younger artists he said well frankly because we simply didn't know whether people were going to come out of their houses. Mm. So you, you, you forget that the, the effect this thing has had on the promoters and on the people running our major institutions is massive. And I happen to know that there is also enormous political pressure for them to make redundancies rather than lose the whole building. Yeah. So um, that, that came from somebody very high up. And that is, that is extraordinary, but of course, mm. I suppose if you're running a government and your major art centres go bust, then that does look pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, it's the people that make the art centres. Art centres are just standing bricks, you know. Mm. It's the people who make the art who are the ones that matter. So it's great to see um, you know, the institutions get quite a lot of money from our government. But at the same time, I, I'm, I'm seeing I'm see so many people in, in really desperate trouble and talking about retraining it's it actually is a bloodbath it, it mm. is a bloodbath of of both professional uh, um, um, salaried and freelance positions because not all people on salaries have continued to be paid and there are there are um, and i know that one major institution is looking at a permanent 35 percent wage cut gosh i, so, I think you know, I, all of this is the 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 um our awareness of what's really going to go on is down the line because there are government schemes protecting us from that and when that changes we will know what the full extent of the damage is. Exactly yeah how is it over there has the government been supporting the arts? Well the, 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 the Arts well? Council the Arts Council here did an amazing thing uh, on the first day of the lockdown they contacted clients said you can draw down up to 90 percent of this year's funding and we understand that you won't necessarily be able to deliver your promised activities, but that's fine. Prioritize payments to artists. Incredible. Incredible. It, it just you made see, everything I mean, so much easier. That's just brilliant. Um, with another major thing that I took on and was, was felt very strongly about was my own festival in Leicester, which is held in, I'm in this virtual building now, uh, which is the, the concert hall at the Leicester Museum on New Walk um, and as soon as the the lockdown happened I, we had a board meeting on this on this medium and and I said um, we're not just cancelling it we can't do that we'll find another way so we worked I mean it was I exaggerate not 10 times the work mm. and 20 times the stress of putting on a normal festival because we not only invited, uh, had all of the musicians come to this concert hall in Leicester, the beginning of September, to record si basically six concerts in one evening, short concerts. And you can find all of these online under Leicester International Music Festival on YouTube, LIMF. They're still available now. Um, and then when the copyright issues um, kick in at uh, the end of a month, you can, um, you'll be able to hear the non-copyright pieces still. So we did those concerts. At the same time, the two days before, we filmed eight concerts 
with the Munster Musical Trust Young Concert Artists Scheme, um, four on, on each day. And we had the first one last week, which was the most wonderful violin and piano recital. So the, the, the festival itself has a, a, week, a week of festival in September. And then from October until about May, with a break for Christmas, we have a series of lunchtime concerts it's held in the same hall. It's a beautiful Steinway piano. And it's a stunning hall because as you can see, it's, a, it's got fantastic art there. And the upstairs of the building has got one of the great um, collections of Picasso ceramics in the world. Mm. It's famous for its German Expressionist collection. Uh, and they do very, uh, also very modern relatable exhibitions. They had a, they've got a Lego exhibition, I think at the moment, which is mm. fabulous. Um, so we recorded eight lunchtime concerts and they're coming out every Thursday. There's another one uh, this Thursday and they're coming out until Christmas. And I, insisted that all of these young artists should play a work by a well it's described as non-male composer and a work from somebody of a black asian or, or minority ethnic background um, that could be the same person actually so for instance if you chose eleanor alberger uh, who's one of the great british talents i think who we featured in our festival this year um, then that that actually hits both of those target zones um, and so it's really fascinating to see young people responding to that in a very assertive and positive way and I think creating programs that are more varied for it. Already last year I brought in for the lunch times a stipulation that everybody should play a piece by a non-male composer and we only got as far as I think March and that was that was um, Sean Shibe who played and he was the, one of the first lockdown concerts he did it from his home on a dreadful internet connection but it was you know we did it we did it and we paid him so we raised money through a crowdfunder um, to do it and and were amazed to be able to do that in fact we're doing a, a BBC broadcast on the 5th of November which is a sort of large-scale full evening concert from Leicester so as you can hear from what I'm saying there's 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 also been an enormous amount of work mm. that too and that was that it became almost obsessive and my my two very closest colleagues there uh, kevin rush and malcolm noble um who both do it for love actually they they we we have a whatsapp group there are thousands of messages on it thousands mm. and, and you know very few chit chat not that there are some jokes but mostly very intense proper discussions about how and then zoom meetings uh, regularly and yeah so that's i'm very proud of that because We've managed to create a keep the lunchtime series alive for the audience. We've managed to uh, create an online festival which was delivered for free. There's lots of debates one can have about whether that's mm. a good idea. It was paid up front and we paid the artists properly to do it. I mean, I think anybody that pays artists, I mean, the, the Westport Festival have, have given us, all of the artists who are supposed to be there have given us a portion of our fee. And I can tell you, I really needed it and I think a lot of us did as well we actually that money was uh, was was incredibly welcome at that point so I, I want to say thank you to Westport for that extremely generous offer and you'd be surprised how many little uh, much smaller music societies and th things have said the same thing or done or, or offered the same thing I haven't always accepted it but I, I think you know there's there's a lot of goodwill out there towards music particularly in the community and that's something we need to build on mm. i feel that very very strongly it's wonderful one of the things i have to touch on before i leave you is that, that there's been a big change in your life you now have new letters after your name you got oh yeah <laughs> I did. how does that yeah. feel it feels fantastic i'm so excited about it you know i mean the thing is <laughs> they they write to you and they said would you be prepared to accept and um and then you you write back and well, I mean, I have to say that the E at the end of it gave me pause for thought. Um, okay. But then I did a little bit of research and I discovered that 65% of British people think empire was a good thing. Okay. And more than 50% of people want an empire back, which is perhaps... Uh, well, but I, very I, strange I, from an Irish perspective. <laughs> I knew you'd love that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
um, and it perhaps explains a little bit of the Brexit debacle, I don't know. But um, mm. um, yeah, I don't know if you can see, I've got a, a, a European Union flag here in the background. Oh, right, my yes, ball. just <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, it, during this time I've taken joint citizenship. I'm, I'm also German and British because I've been a professor in Germany for 15 years. And um, my husband is Polish, and um, so my my action is to is to, to remain European um, in that respect. But in terms of empire, I've got quite a few friends um, who have accepted them and who said yes. It gave them pause for thought. But then, when of course the whole debacle over the last night of the prom started, I was very glad that I hadn't made any comment about it mm. at all um because i just that's a whole twitter thing you don't really want to get sucked in for mm. your mental sanity so i'm absolutely thrilled about it and i'll tell you for why first of all because i realize that you know it's it's a really great thing for that committee which is not all musicians to recognize that i've done something for music i mean i was deeply honored to be given the queen's medal for music some years ago which is a very musical committee so that's and that's a unique honour, one a year. So that's just wonderful. And Imogen Cooper is the is the recipient this year. Um, and um, why I'm so thrilled about it is because after it was announced, which was I think it was about a week ago, um, so many musicians contacted me or made comments on on social media to say that it really meant something to them that I should be remembered at this time, particularly because they're honouring a lot of people who were involved in the COVID, in, try, in trying to deal with COVID, like do doctors, nurses, scientists. So to be remembered at this time with all that going on, it made them feel that music wasn't completely forgotten for a hot minute, you know? So that just, if, if only for that reason, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But actually I, I I'm really happy about it. And I didn't expect to feel, I had to keep quiet for so long. It was like six <laughs> months of keeping quiet because they delayed it because of COVID. And so I was like, oh, please let me tell somebody. Um, but yeah, so it's great. And yeah, I, I mean, I've already um, slightly started to use it a little bit with politics. And, um, and I, but very respectfully, because I don't think anybody gets with this particular flavour of government we have over here at the moment, I think you're not going to get anything from them by simply attacking them and calling mm. them a bunch of um, whatevers. So I think constructive criticism and being uh, a critical friend, a bit like a school governor, is a really is a really good thing. So that's yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it, as always, it's a great pleasure to talk to you. Will you be back in Westport next year? I've got the dates in my diary. I'm hoping for a, for a COVID free life at that point. And I can't wait to come back. I just, I just love it there. I mean, that is such a special place to play, but also the other venues are just great. And I'm, I'm devoted to Catherine Leonard, who I think is one of the great musicians I've ever played with. And, um, uh, and one of my dearest friends and she's, she's just such a fabulous force. And I think she remains that. Um, her, her programming is, is gorgeous and she's got great contacts and lovely people to play with. Mm. So, so I'm looking forward to coming back. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again then. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you. All the best now. Bye. You too. Bye.